Is it possible to beat Kingsfield using only magic? Before Armored Core, before Dark Souls, before Cookie and Cream, there was Kingsfield. But you don't need the history lesson. Just know that I'm a massive From Software fanboy, ever since I picked up this little game in 2003 because I thought it would be like Yu-Gi-Oh. Challenge runs are a common thing among modern FromSoft fans, and people do speedrun the Kingsfield series, but I wanted to do a challenge run of my own, to prove I'm the number one solely boy. And I'd better mention, this is actually Kingsfield 2, with the original Kingsfield released in Japan only. Our hero, Alexander, is a spell sword. In Kingsfield, you're encouraged to use both melee and magic simultaneously. In normal playthroughs, my use for magic is getting in, closing the distance, stopping ranged attacks with my own so I can get within sword range and stun lock them, leaving no chance of a counter attack. But going magic only poses these questions. Is it possible to beat the game without ever swinging a sword? Are there any crucial enemies that cannot be beaten with magic? Is it too difficult? Given the long cooldown times on most spells and the heavy resource management, I think we can do it. The hardest part of a Kingsfield game is usually the beginning, in my opinion, and this challenge will be no exception. The first spell in the game, a simple fireball projectile, is directly behind us as we start. The problem is, you start the game with a measly 30 MP. That allows for a total of only 10 fireballs before we need to find an MP source. Moonstones recharge magic, and we can buy them from the early game shops, but at 650 gold a pop, this is not sustainable. Our first priority then is securing a sustainable source of mana. Early in the game, we can find Seath's Fountain. No, not that Seath, this one. But pretend you didn't see that. The fountain is behind a hidden door in the jail, but we can't get there because we'd have to kill these hollow soldiers to pass their checkpoint. Fortunately, From Software's world design has always been beast. <laughs> this is the North Village. There's a merchant, Necron's sister, and a hole we can drop down. that leads us directly to the Dragon Fountain. We made it. We can heal, but we can only heal hit points. The Magic Fountain is dry. So how do you activate it? Well, we need a Dragon Stone to place in this pedestal. Luckily, it's really close, and we only need to kill one enemy to do it. So up here, through the jail cell, is an archer that kills me by smacking the back of my head. Let's try again. What we need is to liberate a man called Ernest from his jail cell. The guard that has the key is down here. Luckily the guards weren't lurking near the door ready to one-shot me this time. Instead of fighting the jailer in this tiny room, we can duck through this secret door and cheese his AI through the doorway. Okay, so at the beginning of the game your magic cooldown is a lot slower than it will be when you've leveled up a few times or if the magic stat increases, something like that. But I just want you to see how long this takes for this first guard. I mean, look at this. It takes so long. And the door closes. The door closed because I stood too far away, so I have to wait for it to open back up again. At least the magic cools down. Ah, and a miss! You don't want to be missing when you only have 10 shots. God's sake. <laughs> Five fireballs and he's dead. We have the key. When we free Ernest, he gives us the dragon statue. Finally, we can use this statue to activate the fountain, and we now have a never-ending supply of MP. Which leads us to another problem. We're now tied to this fountain. 
If only we could take some of this red water with us. If only we had an ashen est- I mean, crystal flask. There's a crystal flask right near the coastline where we begin the game, along with our second spell, the Wind Cutter. So we have one MP refill to take from the fountain each time. That's progress. At this point I spend some time clearing out enemies. Only around 20% of enemies ever respawn, and some places can be completely emptied by killing mobs just once. So in a regular game it's usually worth killing everything at least once in every area. My damage output is still very low, so I'm hoping that as my magic level increases I'll be able to kill things faster. Backtracking to the beginning of the game lets us get the Stargate SG-1 and a hazardous delve into the small mine gets us the Star Key. This is the warp system in Kingsfield, one of three. We can place the key at any save point and the gate will take us back. The best place to set up our warp point is the save point nearest the fountain then. Warping costs 10 MP, so the last of our mana should always be used to warp us back to the fountain to get more. The problem now though is that one flask isn't enough, and you can get a lot. However, in order to do so, I need to bust through the defences at base 2 and rescue a central village kid from the termite nest, which is a mammoth task. With a newfound bloodlust, I got to second base, wiped out the guards at their checkpoint, except for one archer when my MP ran out. Central village is very important, because this fellow can turn our raw crystals into more flasks. However, this young mother is so concerned about her missing son that she blocks the way into the village and won't let me through. Oh, let me in! Let me in. We have two options, rescue the boy, or spam magic at his mum. For some reason, when an NPC is hit in Kingsfield, they move, just a tiny amount. It took a stupid amount of spells and a dragon crystal, but we finally pushed her. Oh, oh my god, we're through! We made it! We can make more flasks, and oh, she's back in the way and blocked us inside. <sighs> the other thing we can do is go rescue the boy. So we stock up on single use MP items, moonstones, spending all of our spare cash. Now it's into the termite nest. These are tough little bastards, resistant to magic, and whatever you do, don't let them corner you. No, no, no! Oh no, I died to a termite! Quick, subscribe to bring me back to life! No really, please subscribe if you enjoyed the video, I find it very encouraging, and I'd like to make more videos like this. I found myself just rushing around the nest looking for the boy. He's hiding behind the first boss, the termite queen. Simple enough, right? She won't move from the alcove she's guarding. However, her minions respawn infinitely in this room. Killing them will leave me completely out of ammo. So we have to do what's called a pro gamer move. I spam spells at the termite queen while leading her minions around the room in a circle. They caught me once, hit me with paralysis, but I had the healing items to survive. This dance of death lasted almost five minutes. With the queen dead, we can speak to the little tow rag. Now he's rescued and will make his way back to the village. And finally, finally, we can exchange our crystals for more flasks. 
The kid also gave us the pirate key. With the pirate key we can explore the pirate's caves near the beginning. We can find the Kingsfield version of mimic chests. Spooky. We can also find Verdite, a stone which increases our magic power, something we desperately need. The real reason to be here though is the Skull Key, which opens another secret pirate stash on the west coast. Here I realise the earth magic I got from the Termite Queen earlier is the stone spell, which literally just chucks a rock at enemies. I'd never used it in my normal playthroughs, but now I realise it can one-shot skeletons. The only problem is it has a much longer cooldown than the wind cutter or the fireballs I was using before. In the skull cave we get the second dragon stone, and boy are we happy now. This statue will open the third and final water stream back at Seath's fountain, making the waters flow with a golden colour. Yes, that's gold. I know what it looks like, but it's gold, <laughs> okay? The gold potions give us 50 MP each, and also restore most of our health, which is nice I guess. The real benefit of completing the fountain though is that these doors unseal, revealing the North Village save point, and opening shortcuts directly back to Central Village. World design! Now we have a warp point even closer to the fountain. From the central village, we can reach the exterior of Harvine's castle to progress. We fight slash run our way through the courtyards, but we can't yet access the castle proper, as the gates are locked. Beyond the castle, we can drop down, open a shortcut back to central village, and find another giant stone doorway. Here we find the East Village, where another Golden Shower is located, and we take out another outpost of Necron's guards. Beyond them is the Cemetery, where we kill things and loot. Yeah, it's another graveyard, but this one's called the Cemetery. Mm, don't ask. In my opinion, this poxy little island isn't worth anybody dying over. Further still is the half-elf Leon's house. His mother offers us a figure of Seath, whom the elves worship as a god, and asks us to rescue her son from prison. When we go inside to retrieve the statue, she's gone, leaving her chair still rocking. By dropping off a nearby bridge, we can access the dangerous caves at the eastern shore, which are guarded by deadly enemies, traps, and is this Sen's Fortress? Here we loot the Magician's Key, which saves us from having to buy it. The key is very useful as it unlocks many chests throughout the world which contain Verdite Stone, which increases our magic damage, taking us one step closer to becoming the Galaxy Brain Warlock. Another elf named Kai is hiding back at the small mine, busy mashing his face against the wall. We can trade him the figure of Seath for the Moongate, giving us a second warp point to place as we please. One more sweep under the cemetery leaves us stocked up on gold, spells and flasks, and ready to head towards the big mine. But what's in front? Another detachment of guards. We bust through with some difficulty. After placing our warp point in the mines, it's time for us to ride the roller coaster. There are two places we can start our minecart journey from. No powered rails here, this is all downhill baby. Let's see what happens. Okay, that's what happens if you pick the rightmost door and ride those rails. What about the left? It's the base where the guards are operating from and overseeing the mining operation. 
We can find a scorpion bracelet in this bridge over the chasm. That will come in handy later. Let's take this minecart then, and ride it straight into this outpost, where I assume the guards shot me from earlier. I'm trying out my earth wave spell here. It should hit all of them at once, provided they aren't too close to me. I'm getting bodied by these shots though, this is hellish, and I just have to tank it. Did, did that guy just get hit by a minecart? Finally, the earth waves do their job. The guards are dead, we can loot the chest and grab another spell crystal. With no way back, we have to warp out before we can progress again. An amusingly archaic situation, but it's to be expected given the game's age. It's time to tackle the big mine. A gruelling gauntlet, with nowhere to rest along the way. One of the islanders can give us information, and I just love his delivery. This place is the big mine, inside it is the cave of poison, the cave of darkness, the cave of the earth soul, and the elf cave! He's like that friend. Did you have that friend? You know, the one that talks about a game or film and just keeps going on and on and you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. This idiot lost Harvine's key. The key to the castle we saw earlier. It's actually around the corner from him. His loss is our gain. After a while, we reach the poison cave. Usually, it poisons unwitting players on entry, but we have double scorpion bracelets from earlier, and we'll be fine. We can use a figure of Seath to revive my buddy Teo, and that's the last you'll hear about him. Deeper into the labyrinth, we come upon the Earth Soul Cave. Now try saying that quickly. Its dinosaur denizens are none too happy to see me. Their magic attack homes in, and can follow its target around corners. I rushed in looking for a favourable position to attack from. I didn't find one. Another death, courtesy of a blindsiding boulder. No need to reload this time. With the Dragon Fountain active, you'll be revived at the cost of one of your Dragon Crystals, keeping your progress. I rushed back to the Earth Cave, with revenge on my mind. A bit quicker on the healing this time, we can stay alive and light these creatures up with the Firewall spell. Best suited for large targets, it deals repeated damage while the Dino Boys are in its effect. Friendly Fire is on in this game, so using enemies as shields is a viable tactic something you can't do in Dark Souls. Beyond these primordial punks is the boss. It's the same model, but giant. You know what they say, the bigger they are, the easier they are to hit with Firewall. Without his lackeys, he goes down without much of a fight. Deeper still, the fabled Elf Cave is full of these horrors, Refmas. They leech MP on hit, making them the scariest enemy in the game for a magic only guy. And when they die, they look like someone going crazy on a character creation screen with the sliders. Our prize is the Elf Key, a valuable item, which eventually leads to the best gear in the game. The big boy mine is done. We got two important items from Big Mind TM. Remember that castle from earlier? Well, now that we have Harvine's key, we can access the inside. Loading both interior and exterior makes the game chug like never before. Here's where I learned the effectiveness of the waterfall spell. It spawns some glittery water sparkles above enemies' heads. Multi-hit and auto-target you don't have to aim it. It also destroys these fire type enemies, which is good because they can light you up real fast. We find the main chamber unguarded, with one of the ultra important shrine keys in a chest. Surely it can't be that easy. Then some Harry Potter shit happens. The painting speaks, and tells us to do one. Ambushed by Harvine's terracotta army, it's time to try out our new meteor spell. 
Ooh. Nice. Devastating rocks from space. But if you cast without a target, you'll taste your own medicine. Back at the beginning of the game, we can go full Sephiroth and meteor the ink out of this giant kraken. The cave beyond features some tougher versions of the early game squids, but they're not much of a threat, and we can claim the second and final shrine key. So let's head towards that shrine then. As with all new area progress in this game, it's behind a big door and more of Necron's guards. They kind of run this place with their spiky balls. We don't want anything to do with that, so we run through this fireball gauntlet, approach the base from the other side, and turn the oven off, which actually turns the traps off. Upon breaking into this base, we can find the second prison and Leon, whose ghostly mother we met earlier. Lastly, we walk back to the beginning to sell off various fancy armor pieces and loot, all to buy more verdite to further pump our magic. Feeling a tad more powerful, it's time to raid the royal treasury. Another fireball frenzy, but we've got spells for that. Fire resistance, and the ability to sprinkle some water on the statues. Look at this dodge. Nope. Pro plays. Ah! We can actually hit it through the wall with waterfall spell. And it's just more wind magic. The Ice Cave is one of few true progress blockers in the game. Everything up to this point is technically optional, although good luck getting past those fireballs without levelling up. Our firewall is perfect for these icy golems. It's easy to aim, immobilises them, and deals massive damage. You'll want to aim so that they walk into the centre of the fire. There's some great gear in the caves, and the Icy Boy boss. Again, it's the same, but bigger. We run around the pillar like a huge coward, hits him with firewalls, and he goes down like a sack of shit. His death unfreezes the whole room and opens the way to the end game, but there's something we have to do first. We buy the best boots off this shady merchant, then use our two shrine keys and solve a puzzle to open the elven shrine. Inside, there's more bloody refmas. At length, we take them out and exchange our elf key for the dark crystal. Grab magic and talk to some... thing. All this so Leon can make us a sword. The Dark Slayer. Another gift from Seath. Why do I want a sword? Well, it regens MP. That's the only reason, but we'll have to wait for Leon to finish it. We're on the home stretch now. I went around grabbing some items, a few spells, and, you know, casually took out the final outpost. It's no big deal. But when I went back to Leon to collect my damn sword, Necron had taken it. Leon's like, sorry mate. Oh, don't worry Leon, I'll go get it. You just stay there and water your plants. It's fine. We now face Necron's Colosseum. A boss rush of more big boys. We must take them out before we can face Necron and retrieve the sword. First up, a giant copper knight. The meteor will do for him. Second, a giant giant ice golem. Time to try out the ultimate fire spell, flame. The phoenix rises into your face, dealing massive splash damage and very unsafe to the caster. Third, a more threatening earth dino. Those rocks can make quick work of the ill-prepared. A tougher battle than last time, I had to try different spells before settling on firewall again. Fourth, a new challenger. His shots ring out from the dark. The demon lord. Not seen since the original Kingsfield. I froze him just to get some breathing room. Double Phoenix sees him bend the knee. 2,000 gold in the chest, a paltry sum, 
Our eyes are set on a greater prize. Above Necron himself waits the Dark Slayer, the sword that will recharge our magic. Necron is the primary antagonist. I didn't take him seriously. With sword in hand, he's easier to dispatch, but with only our spells and our wits, he leaves us humbled. Maintain any sort of distance from Necron, and he'll use his flash spell on you. It can track behind you, with devastating results. <coughs> Round 2. I don't know what to do, or what works, so I'm just throwing anything out. The freezing dragon does nothing. I stay close while trying different spells. I'd rather taste his blade than another explosion, and this way there's the chance I can get behind him to relative safety. Firestorm seems to be working, but when he unleashes his own earth wave, it proves too much for me. Round 3. Feels like I'm getting there. If I can trap him in the middle of Firewall, he takes repeated damage, but his movement is too quick and erratic for me to land it reliably. All the while, he can easily hit me with Earthwave. It's just a matter of time before I run out of resources. The fight takes its toll mentally, and I kill myself by mistake. Right, we need more power. We clear out the rest of his stronghold, looking for anything that'll give us an edge, and levelling up a bit more in the process. We sell the stuff we found, and buy a ton of healing herbs, MP stones, and verdite. Final round. I have a new technique for our fourth match. The trusty waterfall. We don't need to aim it, and while it's on him, he can't hit us. When Necron is momentarily staggered, we can slip behind him, so when he moves again, he has to rotate to face us before attacking. This is the water dance. He won't be able to hit me much anymore, but I'm not doing much damage. This is cheap, lame, boring even. But it worked. It just took six minutes. Gotcha. That's not me adding slow-mo by the way, this is the game. Meanwhile, I was fist pumping in real life. Give me that sword. A Dark Slayer. I won't swing it once, but that sweet MP regen. The sword also opens doors in the game that bear a mural of Seath, allowing us to obtain his full armor set. The only thing left is the Dark Dragon. In the end game, we use Necron's spell, the Flash. It's a salvo of projectiles that explode on impact. Fast, accurate, and deadly. A worthy weapon for a wizard waging war. Now it's into Gyra's pocket dimension. These weird mecha variants of enemies get destroyed by me flashing them. Ah, teleporter mazes. We love to hate them. The Dark Dragon, Gyra. At this point, I thought the run was finished. I thought it was impossible to beat him. His minions, the bits, absorbed my flash spell. They absorb everything. And they can't be hurt by magic. If only I could just slash them, but I can't. In the background, the Moonlight Sword is out of reach and mocks me. But what was that? It looks like that spell landed on Gyra. He recoiled. I try again. Wind Cutter, my trusty bread and butter spell from the early game. It flies straight and true. Too fast for the orbs to catch and absorb. Gyra's screech of pain tells me that I can do it. We can win this. I'm convinced now that nothing else will work. The dragon attacks, and the lasers fired by his orbs take their toll. 
but we'll come back for the rematch, stocked up on flasks. This fight is grueling. The short cooldown on my attack means I'm firing often while taking frequent hits. I aimed for the dragon's head so my spell hits instantly without having to travel. Managing to rattle off little combos on him made this feel like a real battle. And what a battle it was. It took 7 minutes and 84 wind cutters. Yeah, I counted. But finally, the dark dragon falls and we've done it! We've beaten Kingsfield 2 using only magic. I enjoyed this playthrough, I really did. It made the whole game feel like a slow tactical FPS with resource management being key. Thank you so much for watching this far. Please share this video with any Kingsfield or From Software fans that might be interested in it. As for what I'll do next, it could be the original Kingsfield Japan. I know that can be beaten magic only. As for the other Kingsfields, I'm not so sure. Or I could try Eternal Ring, melee only, no magic, which would be absolute memes. This is all dependent on how well this video does though. I hope to see you again. And may you find your worth in the waking world. <laughs>